Good morning. I, I can't see any of your faces. I don't know what happened, so I'm hoping you can hear my voice. <laughs> Our scripture this morning is taken from the 17th chapter of Genesis. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. And then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations and no longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be called Abraham for I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai, her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come for her. I ran across this thing the other day, which actually refocused my whole sermon and I had to redo it. One day a man went to his son's room and he knocked on the door. John, wake up. It's time for you to go to school. From inside, the answer came back. I don't want to go to school, Dad. The father was persistent. And he knocked again and he said, you must go to school. The answer came back. I don't want to go to school. Why not, asked the father. There are three reasons, came the reply. First, I find school boring. Second, the kids treat me terribly. And third, I simply hate school. And then the father responded and he said, you have given me three reasons for not going to school. I will give you three that say you must attend. First, it is your duty. And second, you are 45 years old. And third, you are the principal. This story suggests the problems we oftentimes have in meeting our commitments to others, to work, and even to God. Sometimes we are too busy, and on other occasions, we are too tired to meet our commitments. There are times as well, if we are honest, when we simply are lazy or see no value in what we are asked to do. There are even those occasions when people are hostile to their responsibilities and they openly reject their duties. We're asked to do many things, tasks and responsibilities, which in some ways are contractual. And these duties may be formal or informal. They might be written or verbal, understood and acknowledged or just assumed. But when they're not completed, there are generally consequences to pay. We're all familiar with contracts. A contract is an agreement between at least two different parties in which each person or group agrees to perform a certain task, pay a certain amount of money, or provide a certain service that is needed by the other party. Contracts come in many different forms, but the most formal kind is a written document. Now, most of us have a contract for the place where we live, a mortgage or a rental agreement. And we agree to pay a certain amount of money each month. And in return, the contractor of the home or the apartment owner is to provide for us a residence. We use contracts when we purchase most high priced items like cars and electronic equipment. Most of us have a contract or two with certain credit card companies. There's another form of contract, which is more subtle, but certainly more common and generally more important than any written agreement. Verbal contracts are made all of the time. 
whether we realize it or not. And these are very significant for they're used every day of our lives. Married people live under a contract made the day they profess their vows to each other. Couples promise fidelity and love and honor and companionship until the day they die. Each time we promise to pick someone up, meet a person at a designated spot, run an errand or even visit a sick friend or a relative, we have made a verbal contract. We usually don't think of these daily occurrences as contracts, but most assuredly there are agreements where at least two parties are counting upon each other. Contracts that work well service all concerns, but those that are broken are problematic for those involved. The consequences for failure in contracts differ depending upon the nature of the agreement. If we fail to make our house or our car payment, there will be a period of grace, but ultimately the item upon which we owe money will be taken away, repossessed, and we will lose both the item and our investment. Because the consequences, <clears throat> excuse me, because the consequences of failure in written contracts are high, people are generally faithful to these agreements. The consequences of failure in a verbal agreement do not on the surface appear to be that great. And thus the incidents of non-compliance are very high. If we fail a friend or a family member, the result may be some frustration or anger or even a temporary parting of a company. But somehow the severity of what we have done does not register with us. The consequences do not appear to be problematic. On this second day of Lent, second Sunday of Lent, our first sermon describes, our first lesson <laughs> describes the special contract or covenant made between God and Abraham an agreement that was the basis of a relationship between the Lord and the Hebrew people. The book of Genesis actually presents two versions of the covenant as it does with the creation story. In the 15th chapter, we read the Yahwist version of the great covenant that was written in the 10th century BC. And it emphasizes the role of the tribe of Judah in the Hebrew community. In this version, Abram, while being warned of the future bondage of his people in a strange land, a prediction of the community's trial in Egypt, is promised descendants as, as numerous as the stars in the sky. Today's lesson, the second of the Great Covenant series, comes from the priestly tradition of the Hebrew scriptures, and it was written about, uh, I think, 500 BC. And emphasizing the Hebrew tradition in well ordered prose. Abram is in the earlier covenant version, is promised multiple generations as a unilateral pact between God and God's people. Here, God extends the promise to succeeding generations, and the patriarch seals the agreement with the promise of circumcision for all male descendants. The priestly author also adds the important detail that both Abram and Sarai have their names changed after the covenant is made. Scholars suggest that this signifies a change in life and or a function for the bearer. It's also indicated a turning point in one's life. The relationship between God and God's people, the Hebrews, was from henceforward different. Each party had agreed to be faithful to the other. Each was to uphold its end in the agreement. And we know by faith and history that God was and is ever faithful on his part. But unfortunately, the same could not be said of Israel, nor for that matter of the Gentiles, the inheritors of that great promise. Lent should be a time to revisit and to reevaluate our commitments, our promises, and our contracts in all aspects of our lives. 
the Christian community collectively and individually has made a significant contract with God through the sacrament of baptism. This contract was sealed when for most of us, our parents and godparents as speaking on our behalf, perhaps told the minister and helped us share who administered this sacrament that we believed in God, the father, the son and the Holy Spirit and in the life and the mission of the Christian community, the church. As children, we might not have known of this special contract, but as we mature and we gain knowledge, it becomes incumbent on the Christian to learn the nature of the pact made between the individual and God and make certain that our half of the agreement is fulfilled. God and the Christian community have always been faithful in upholding their end of the contract. God is ever present in our lives. He's patiently listening and leading and guiding and sometimes challenging and cajoling us in an effort to push us towards the goal of our eternal reward with the Lord. We at times might think that God is not listening, that he's uncaring or he's asleep on the job, but such can never be the case. We remember well the words of Isaiah. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even those may forget, yet I will not forget you. God provides the leadership and he points the way through the church and we're asked to follow. God provides us with the sacraments as moments of his grace and his special presence in our lives. We have the wonderful gift of our church community's proximity to our lives, supporting and assisting, and yes, at times, even challenging us to be all that we can be in the eyes of the Lord God and the community of the faithful have met their commitments to us. Have we been as faithful to God and the church? The Christian life gives us many privileges, but there are significant responsibilities that we must meet in order to uphold our end of our contract with God. The most basic element of our agreement with God is something I suspect most of us don't think about very much. We're called to be holy. We have a common vocation to holiness. Members of the church community participate in many varied and generally multiplied vocations. Some are called to the vocation of the married state, others, offer, others to the single life, and others to the covenant of priesthood service. And this, however, is only the most basic avenue of our life vocation. There are many other subvocations in which we have to participate. Many people are called to the vocation of parenthood. All of us have some occupation, the daily work to, that we do. And in this light, we might have the vocation of professional service as a physician or an attorney, as an engineer or a teacher. We may have the vocation of greater direct service in sales or ministry in church or outreach to the poor or destitute destitute of our world. Some people are called to more individual vocations and offices as clerical workers or writers or computer operators or programmers. But regardless of our state in life or the day-to-day -day work that we perform, all of us are called to lives of holiness. It is our basic and common vocation and one that we can never let slide. When we forget or disregard this most basic element of our relationship with God, we have failed in fulfilling our end of the contract with the consequence that we might become estranged from God and estranged from our faith community. The contract will be broken 
and its benefits for both parties can be lost. Our contract with God goes beyond the basic requirement of holiness. We are called to hear the Lord's voice and respond to his call to follow me. Discipleship is the second step in the common response of God's people to the one who first loved us. We simply cannot bury our heads in the sand like the proverbial ostrich and think that God will not see us or that the Christian community will not miss our presence. Discipleship is not an option. It's a requirement of our contract, our baptismal promise made to God. Being a true follower of Jesus is not a passive endeavor, but rather it requires our active participation. We often wish to place limits or attach special requirements to our active discipleship. But the famous pastor and theologian and writer Dietrich Bonhoeffer told us in one of his books that being a true follower of Jesus Christ will cost us everything, even our life. We cannot make compromises with the Lord and say, I will be your disciple tomorrow, but I'm too busy or not of the right mind today. Such an attitude suggests an on-again, off-again agreement with God. But this cannot be for the true and the loyal disciple. God, as we read in the immortal poem, The Hound of Heaven suggests, never ceases to be our advocate and will leave no stone unturned in the searching for our soul. We therefore cannot take an attitude of partial participation. We can either follow Jesus all of the way, or we can leave the road somewhere along the journey. The choice is ours. And yet we know because we have been promised where the journey will end. Paul reminds us in Corinthians, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. The requirements of discipleship <clears throat> are multiple and they can be absorbed under the idea of faithfulness. But during the great season of Lent, the concept of service to God's people might well be emphasized. We are called to minister to God's people in little and great ways. If we have the time and the energy and the opportunity to serve the poor in some sort of volunteer service, such as a Central Avenue Center. This will be a great response to the call of discipleship and certainly would make great strides in upholding our end of the contract with God. We may have the opportunity to visit a sick neighbor or a relative or possibly assist a needy person next door with some routine household task. Our service need not be pointed outward, but might be even more needed within our own families. Sometimes we become so wrapped up in the needs of others that we forget, or at least we gloss over our duty of service to those that we know and love the most. Children can do lots to help out around the house. Parents can make special efforts to spend more time with their children. Families in general can spend greater quantity and quality time together. Now, this might not, like, might not seem like service. It might even appear to be self-serving. But how can we muster sufficient strength and fortitude to be good disciples and ministers to others if we cannot gain strength from the most basic unit of our common human experience. Strengthening family life and fostering its membership is eternal service and most certainly is appreciated by the Creator God. The holy season of Lent provides us with the opportunity to renew 
and to strengthen the many contracts that we have made with people. In most all cases, these are verbal agreements and thus the ones that might slip because of ramifications of our failures in such contracts will not result in the repossession of a material item or the loss of our job. And yet our verbal contracts, especially those made to God, are the most important because they are signed not on paper, but on our hearts and are thus of great significance. Lent is a time for spouses to recommit themselves to each other. Marriage is a verbal contract of commitment and love that needs to be fostered and renewed on a regular basis. And those who have chosen the married vocation and family have the obligation to revitalize this most basic human unit. We can also take time to reflect on how we can recommit ourselves in our place of work. At times, our day-to-day -day job may become so routine and so dull that we don't want to continue. And we need to ask ourselves, what can we do to put more spark into these daily tasks so that we will faithfully and completely maintain our end of the agreement that we made with our employer? But the most important contract renewal we must make is our agreement to God and to God's people. Living our baptismal commitment fully as a holy and a committed people, following Jesus as true disciples is absolutely necessary. It is not an option. And through the traditional Lenten practices of prayer and fasting and almsgiving, we have the opportunity to renew and to strengthen our contract with the Lord. We at times may not feel like meeting our commitments. We might even feel like running away. But such an attitude is inconsistent with our Christian life. And it demonstrates no trust in God who is ever faithful, always present, and ready to renew his side of the bargain. As members of the Christian community, we have responsibilities that are in many ways contractual, but they're not in written form. As God made a contract with Abram, sealing it with the change of name to Abraham and the practice of circumcision, so we have a contract with the Lord, sealed with our baptismal commitments to live holy lives as disciples. During this Lenten season, let us renew our relationships with the many people with whom we have contracts within our family, our place of worth, and most especially with God and God's people, the church. Let us be faithful to what we proclaim. It is Jesus's kingdom that we preach and we build and await. It is the Lord's life of holiness and faith that we seek to emulate today and to life eternal. I wish I could get your pictures back right now because I want to see your faces. I don't know what's happened. I'm on locked on to the, the main screen, I guess. I don't know what led this particular sermon. It's not the one I had planned for you, but Friday night I was prompted to, to redo everything. But the one thing I want to profess, and I'd like to see your faces to do this, is I want to affirm first the love that your creator God has for you and that the joy you have brought to his heart with your commitment to one another and bolstering each other's spirits during this time of isolation. Particularly your enthusiasm with working with the Center of Hope and reaching out to do those things. But in bolstering up one another as we voice some of our weaknesses and disappointments in our little exchanges, the leadership of our pastors that in spite of the isolation and other difficulties have managed to reach out to individuals throughout this congregation and reaffirm through their ministry 
the love of the creator God. One thing about Zoom is I've got to participate for half a globe <laughs> with sermons and and just in sharing and with evangelistic efforts. And I found in each and every congregation I looked some evidence of the strength of community as they strive to uphold their part of this contract. And it is with great joy from the East Coast to Hawaii that I look upon you in the mornings when you speak and you talk about getting stuff together for the Center of Hope of encouraging one another in, in, like in sharing with Ruthie's uh, ordination last Sunday, the strength that we have in fulfilling our part of our command, our contract. So I wanna emphasize with you how pleased God is and how deeply he loves you and encourage you that in spite of all of our circumstances that we continue together and his part of the contract is always kept. He will always be with us in our worst moments, in our best moments, in our moments of loneliness, our time together. We can count on him always being there. And we have but to respond to feel that blessing and to be a blessed people. Amen.